Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and welcome to the 14th Australian Accounting Hall of Fame Awards and Dinner for 2023. Happily back as our first in-person event since 2020. My name is Jane Horonsky. I'm a director of the Centre for Accounting and Industry Partnerships and will be your MC this evening. I'd like to commence the evening by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay respects to their elders past and present. Woman Jaker, welcome. I also wish to acknowledge and thank our generous sponsors for this event, CPA Australia, who are represented here tonight by Rebecca Keppel-Jones and Richard Ferrier, and CAANZ, who are represented by Simon Han and Anthony Mattis. On a sad note, the Hall of Fame would like to acknowledge and note the passing of two VIPs since we last met. The first is Fitzgerald Professor Emeritus Ken Wright, who passed away in late 2022, just shy of his 97th birthday. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2014, recognised as a theorist and scholar of the highest order. Vale, Ken Wright. The second is Mrs Wynne Leslie, who also passed in late 2022 at the age of 97. Wynne was the daughter of Hall of Fame inductee Professor Sir Alexander Fitzgerald and for many years was a great supporter and friend of the Hall of Fame. Vale, Wynne Leslie. On a brighter note, we thank all those people who were nominators for 2023. We have six inductees this year. Present tonight in alphabetical order are Fiona Campbell, Peter Easton, Helen Wedd, representing her father, the late Garrett Fitzgerald, Kim Langfield-Smith and Stephen Taylor. Welcome. Rachel Grimes, also a 2023 inductee, cannot be present here tonight, but will be formally inducted in 2024. On International Women's Day, it's noteworthy that we have the pleasing coincidence of an equal number of women and men inductees for the first time. I also wish to acknowledge past inductees, members of the Hall of Fame or their representatives, who are present tonight. Bill Edge, Stuart Leach, Kevin Stevenson, Roger Simnett, Ken Trotman and Ron Weber. Last, but most certainly not least, welcome to our Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economics, Professor Paul Kaufman. It is now my very great pleasure to call upon Professor Emeritus of Monash University, Ron Weber, to present the Professor Colin Ferguson Oration for 2023. The late Colin Ferguson was a great friend and colleague to many of us and was instrumental in the formation of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. So it is fitting that this oration is named in his honour. Our speaker tonight, Ron Weber, was himself inducted to the Hall of Fame in 2018, recognising a highly distinguished and impactful career across the twin disciplines of accounting and information systems. His achievements over his career are simply too many for me to enumerate here, so I'll just note a few salient points. An outstanding research and teaching career with recognition for seminal contributions to the information systems literature. Senior office bearing in academia and for both accounting and information systems professions. The only non-American editor of the MIS Quarterly Journal and a prestigious fellow of the Academy of Social Science in Australia. I now hand over to Ron. Thank you, Jane, for your kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. First, I would like to thank the directors of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame for their kind invitation to deliver the 2023 Colin Ferguson oration. 
I feel deeply honoured to be asked to acknowledge and remember Col in this way. Col was my colleague at the University of Queensland from 1994 to 2004. He was a special person, someone with enormous energy, a bright, happy personality, and someone who could quickly garner support with just about anyone. He was instrumental in setting up the Executive in Residence program in the then Department of Commerce and fostering excellent relationships between the business community and the department. He brought a sense of goodwill to everything that he did. But Cole was a Victorian through and through. It came as no surprise, therefore, that when, much to our disappointment, he announced he was leaving, he went from the University of Queensland to take a position in the Department of Accounting at the University of Melbourne. It was a clear case of UQ's loss and UM's gain. Some of you may know that Cole was an outstanding golfer. I once asked him how he became so proficient at the game, and he said it was because he had learned to play golf at Warrnambool. When he saw my quizzical look, he explained that all the trees in Warrnambool grew at an angle because of these wings that cross back straight. So many of the days he played golf. Cole would say that if you learn to play golf at the Bool, you could play golf just about anywhere in the world. He was right. When an unwanted wind started to blow that would bring about Cole's untimely death, he still played his last game at the Bool with great courage and determination. After receiving the director's kind invitation to deliver this oration, I asked them whether there were any specific topics that they would like me to address. I received some excellent suggestions, but the one I finally chose will hopefully be of interest to most, if not all of you here tonight. Namely, the role that artificial intelligence is likely to play when we consider the future of accounting. So please let me begin my oration, which I've titled, Some Prognostications, Artificial Intelligence and Accounting. At the outset, I'd like to indicate that I'm going to take a tack that might surprise you. Specifically, I'm not going to try to wow you with AI innovations that potentially will turn the accounting field on its head. I totally tend to leave me cold, especially when it clouds deep issues that need to be addressed. And I totally about the latest information technology becomes dated quickly and sometimes quite funny in hindsight. Instead, I want to examine the likely impact of AI on accounting from a more philosophical perspective. That being I have foundation for what will follow with two anecdotes. Here's the first anecdote. When I was studying for my PhD at the University of Minnesota in the mid-1970s, I had some involvement with several academics and students who were trying to figure out how humans understood language. Their goal was to build software that would understand natural language input to a computer through either voice or text by emulating how humans understood natural language. Some of you will remember that the mid-1970s were the days before personal computers, the World Wide Web and graphical user interfaces. Working with computers was still difficult. Yes, at the time we were still in the dark ages of computing. Here's a second anecdote. In 1982, I spent a six-month sabbatical leave at New York University. There I met a colleague who was trying to build a computer program to play the Chinese game of Go. Now, I'd never heard of Go until I went to NYU. It's the oldest board game in existence, apparently over 2,500 years old, and in several ways it is more complex and difficult than the game of chess. The reason why my colleague at NYU was interested in Go was that he already had extensive experience in building chess playing programs. He was a graduate of the Carnegie Mellon AI Laboratory, led by two famous scholars, Nobel Laureate in Economics and A.M. Turing Award winner, essentially the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, Herbert Simon, and Alan Newell, who was also a winner of the A.M. Turing Award with Simon. 
In Simon and Ewell's laboratory at Carnegie, my colleague had worked on chess playing programs that were written based on the ways that grand masters play chess. He hoped he would get additional insights about human intelligence by working with grandmasters in the game of Go. What happens subsequently? We now have natural language understanding software, for example Siri, that is fairly good at understanding spoken natural language. The way the software works, however, is nothing like the way humans understand natural language, at least to the best of our knowledge. Rather, the software depends on the, the breath, breathtaking speeds with which modern computers now operate, the availability of a high-speed communication network, and high-speed enormous capacity storage devices that now exist. For instance, when you ask Siri to do something, a sound file gets transmitted via the internet to Apple computers. The sounds are matched against the database of sounds and their corresponding words. Siri then uses pattern recognition with an enormous database of phrases, questions and answers to determine what most likely is being said and its meaning. A similar situation exists with chess playing programs. They don't work like human chess playing people. Instead, they use brute force methods to determine their moves. They access a huge database of historical grandmaster games winning end games, strategic moves, and so on. And they have sophisticated algorithms that they use to examine millions of positions in a second and to optimally evaluate their next move. Today, many chess playing programs exist that will beat the best human chess players every time. Do the impressive capabilities of speech recognition software and chess playing software manifest that they possess human-like intelligence? I believe the answer is no, and the situation with speech recognition software and chess playing software typifies AI work in other domains. Recently I was corresponding with a colleague who does research in the AI field, and he summarised the current status of AI as follows. A field that uses algorithms based on numerical pattern recognition and linear and non-linear in-space classifiers. Will this situation change? At some time in the future, are we likely to see AI programs that mirror human intelligence in the accounting domain? My view is that the answer is no, and here I want to turn to some philosophy to explain my reasons. If computer programs are to have any chance of mirroring human intelligence, I believe we first need to solve a deep problem that philosophers and cognitive scientists call the mind-body problem. Basically, the mind-body problem addresses the questions of what constitutes human, the human mind, how human consciousness arises, and how the human consciousness relates to the human body. Almost 30 years ago, an Australian philosopher named David Chalmers called the mind-body problem the hard problem in philosophy. The fact that his name for the problem is still in vogue reflects that we currently have a long way to go before we have some sense of whether the mind-body problem can be solved. While the solution to the hard problem of human consciousness and intelligence remains elusive, nonetheless some philosophers have given us a theory of how they believe human consciousness and intelligence have come about. I want to use their theory to explain why I doubt AI will ever mirror human intelligence, but I also want to stress that the theory is not universally accepted. Clearly, human consciousness and intelligence didn't always exist. Specifically, the theory I'm using postulates that they arose progressively over the eons through a particular evolutionary process. This process involves things in the world beginning to interact with other things, and these interactions then leading to the formation of newer, more complex things. Now, these things have a critical feature. Namely, they possess new properties not possessed by their components, so-called emergent properties. These novel 
properties that somehow related to the properties of their components, but how they relate to these components is a more complex issue. Let me illustrate the notion of emergent properties through a simple example. Consider a work team that has a number of employees who interact with each other to perform certain tasks. The cohesiveness of the work team is an emergent property of the team. Somehow, cohesiveness is related to the properties of the individuals who make up the team, but it's not a property of the individual members of the team. We don't say a person is cohesive. And so the evolutionary process goes on. Things assemble into more complex things, newer complex things. These new things have emergent properties. These new things then assemble into still more complex things, which in turn have emergent properties. Think about humans. Therefore, it's extraordinarily complex, a complex level structure of things. In essence, the things are systems that have assembled over time. Billions of years ago, the evolutionary process that led to the emergence of humans began with particular atoms. These atoms eventually assembled into molecules. Some of these molecules assembled into organelles. Eventually, we see the formation of cells, tissues, organs, and then organisms as the assembly process that underpins human evolution continued to unfold. Finally, we have a human made up of about 100 trillion cells, and each of these cells in turn is made up of about 100 trillion atoms. All the components of a human, atoms, cells, tissues and so on, are things, systems with emergent properties. What does this mean for chances of machines ever emulating human consciousness and intelligence? If the philosophers are right, the answer is the chances are not good. The reason is that we know the emergent properties of higher level systems depend in some way on the properties of their components, and the emergent properties of their components in turn depend on the properties of their own components. Think about the numbers. Remember the human body has roughly one trillion cells, each of which is composed of roughly one trillion atoms. Of course, there are many instances of just a few types of atoms, such as hydrogen and oxygen, and there are many instances of particular types of cells, such as red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets and stem cells. Nonetheless, the actual number of atoms in a molecule is important to the emergent properties possessed by the molecule, e.g. H2O for water, and the actual number of molecules in a cell are important to the emergent properties of the cell. To make matters even more complex, after high-level systems have evolved, we know that they can sometimes exert an influence on their lower-level components, the components that initially assemble to form the higher-level system, such that the properties of the lower-level systems change. For instance, consider someone who works or who becomes a head of department or a dean in a university. They acquire new properties, such as the authority to make certain decisions. And another property is the unbelievable frustrations of writing from being a head or a dean in the university. And they can lose certain properties, I can assure you. For instance, if you are a head or a dean, the property you will often live is the will to live, lose is the will to live. So we have this complex network of interconnections among the components at all levels of the human body such that emergent properties arise at each level that in turn underpin the emergent properties of higher level components. Then we have the properties of these higher level systems affecting the properties of their lower level components. In the course of evolution, the philosophical theory I'm using hypothesizes that eventually some kind of stasis arose whereby humans and emergent properties that we call, they had emergent properties, that we call consciousness and intelligence. If we're trying to mirror human intelligence, here's the catch. First, we don't always know what connections between the various components exist. And even if we did know them, what they exist, we may not know their exact nature and how to replicate them. 
Even though research is now being done at an increasingly rapid rate, I doubt we will be able to explicate for a long time yet, if ever, the identity of and nature of all the connections between all the components at different levels that provide the foundation for human consciousness and human intelligence. Here then is a moral to my story. Focusing on whether computers can and eventually will have the capabilities to mirror human consciousness and human intelligence is, in my opinion, the wrong focus. I doubt this will ever occur. Humans are the outcome of an evolutionary process that has occurred over billions of years. After a couple of thousand years of philosophers trying to understand human consciousness and intelligence, and more recently cognitive neuroscientists tackling the same task, we have barely scratched the surface. We also have to consider the properties that continue to differentiate humans from machines. Empathy, sympathy, love, self-sacrifice. Can you envisage a machine with these properties? Can you conceive of a situation where you and a computer might fall in love with each other? Hmm, perhaps this would be the ultimate form of kinkiness. Does the moral to my story mean that as humans, as accountants, we do not have to be concerned about artificial intelligence because the likelihood of computers being able to mirror human intelligence, at least for the foreseeable future, is very low? The answer is a resounding no. A certain type of intelligence, let's just simply call it machine intelligence, will continue to evolve rapidly as computers get faster and more powerful and our knowledge of how to use them increasingly um, uh, is, is, is much better. If this form of artificial intelligence, that has to be our focus. We need to focus on this form. The reason is that we need to understand the nature of and significant implications of a concept that philosophers interested in general systems call equifinality. Very simply, the idea that we can sometimes achieve the same or almost the same outcomes using different processes. The examples of language recognition software and chest plane software are good examples of equifinality in practice. We don't have quite the same outcomes with the software as we do with humans, but in one case, natural language recognition software, the outcome is good enough for many purposes. And in the other case, chess playing software, we have a superior outcome, at least if winning the game is our objective. For those of us who are academics, we now have concerns about AI programs such as ChatGPT being used to answer uh, questions we ask on examinations or assignments. The answers look like human answers to the assignments, this is another example of human equifinality at work. I predict that the challenges we face because of equifinality will become increasingly important. In this regard, we're at the dawn of quantum computing, currently a field of research that promises the development of a new kind of computer that can perform certain kinds of calculations in a few seconds that it would otherwise take today's computers, our supercomputers, decades or millennia to complete. Quantum computing aside, faster processes continue to be developed, faster and larger storage devices continue to appear, improved machine learning algorithms have been developed, better pattern matching techniques have been identified, and improved classification techniques have been developed. Where to from here? As accountants, what should we do where machine intelligence will develop continually and much rapidly, much more rapidly. I wish I had privileged insights, but sadly I don't. For what it's worth, however, I'd like to conclude my oration with just a few thoughts that might provide some matters for reflection. First, as accountants, we should focus on identifying those tasks where humans are likely to have long-term comparative advantage over computers. I suspect these kinds of tasks will be those that require very human attributes, for instance, an ability to interact with others with warmth and empathy, an ability to read body language, a sense of the ephemeral and the spiritual, and an ability to develop rapport and trust. We should continue to develop our capabilities in relation to these tasks. 
Second, I believe we need to think hard about those accounting tasks where machine intelligence will have a comparative advantage over humans. We have some pointers to the tasks that will be affected, specifically those accounting tasks that are amenable to machine learning algorithms, pattern matching techniques, and classification techniques. We should exit systematically from these tasks. Third, we can look for opportunities to work synergistically with machine intelligence. As accountants, ultimately, we are seeking ways to provide information about economic phenomena. With better tools, we are progressively expanding our views on what economic phenomena can and should be our focus. In this regard, I'm mindful of Bill East's wonderful oration last year, where he spoke about developments in sustainability reporting and the opportunities provided to accountants. With powerful tools such as networks of environmental sensors, pattern recognition software, machine learning software, and creative thinking, we can expand the scope of the work we do as accountants. Now for my closing comment. I feel some sense of irony and remorse about the topic of my oration. My focus has been on artificial intelligence and its possible implications for the accounting profession. But we are commemorating someone who had very real human intelligence. There was nothing artificial about it. I hope Cole will forgive me. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for those interesting and enlightening words. You've certainly given us food for thought. We now commence the formal proceedings of induction for this evening. Each inductee will have their citation read by their nominator and will then be given the opportunity to speak. Congratulations once again to the 2023 inductees to the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. Fiona Margaret Campbell graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce at Deakin University before commencing her career in Audit and Assurance Services at EY. As partner in charge of a portfolio of clients across a diverse range of industries and sectors, Fiona has had to deal with complex accounting and auditing issues, requiring significant judgment. In this role, she contributed to the design and implementation of EY's global audit strategy, ensuring compliance with international and local auditing standards. Fiona is currently the Asia-Pacific SQM leader, overseeing EY's implementation of the International Standards of Quality Management, ISQM 1 and 2, across the Asia-Pacific area. As a highly regarded technical audit specialist, Fiona has served the profession at the highest levels and as an audit standard setter. As a board member on the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, the IAASB, Fiona served the maximum term of six years, retiring from the board in December 2020. For the last two years, she also served as deputy chair of the board. As a member of the IAASB, Fiona worked across borders, time zones and cultural barriers to engage with stakeholders, understand complex issues and build consensus on solutions to provide pathways forward. Fiona's part IAASB experience also included task force chair responsible for the redesigning and enhancing ISA 315 risk assessments membership of the board that designed, enhanced and updated ISQM standards, ISA 540 estimates, ISA 220 planning the audit, various knocker changes and other various auditing reporting standards. Fiona also was a task force member of the Data Analytics Working Group, now called the Technology Working Group, and the Fraud Working Group, as the chair until retiring from the IAASB. For the last four years of her six-year term on the IAASB, Fiona was a member of the board's steering committee, a role that provided a unique opportunity to influence the key projects and work plan of the IAASB, as well as to provide direct support for the chairman and the technical director. 
During her time on the IAASB, Fiona was also a correspondent member of the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants Working Group on the new definition of the public interest entity. Fiona Campbell has also found time to work as a member of various not-for-profit boards and audit committees, including chairing the Uniting Age Well, Victoria and Tasmania Audit and Risk Committee. For the past three years, Fiona has chaired Deakin Business School Advisory Board, having previously served as a member of the Deakin Business School Domestic Advisory Board. Fiona Campbell is a Fellow of Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, and in March 2013, she was awarded the Lynn Sutherland Award, an EY award, created to recognise people who contribute to the development and retention of women in the profession. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame honours Fiona Margaret Campbell as an auditing standard setter and practitioner. Thank you for this incredible honour. Thank you to the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame, the committee who read through all of the nominations, the organisers, the sponsors, and all of the people who make this such an amazing honour to be part of. I want to start by thanking Robin Maroney for nominating me. At the time, I thought she was joking when she mentioned it. And then I quickly moved to I couldn't possibly be worthy enough to be nominated, let alone be old enough. That led me to my second person I would like to thank, my partner Shane. I mentioned to Shane that Robin had raised this with me and that I was going to tell her I didn't want to be nominated. Shane quickly talked me out of that, saying that I of course deserved to be nominated given all of the hard work I'd put into my career for the 20 years he has known me. Thank you, Shane, for all of the love and support you have given to me. Everything from being my travel buddy as I traipsed around the globe, listening to me vent when I was frustrated about a sentence in an auditing standard, sitting through hours of boring work talk over dinners with workmates, and also letting me use your extra luggage allowance to sneak home any overseas purchases I made after you carried them all over New York. I'm sure all the conversations about ISA 315, ISQM1, the IAASB, audit methodology, policies and procedures are the highlight of your day. Of course, I wouldn't be here without my parents and family. I had a great upbringing in rural New Zealand. I was born in the deep south of the South Island, and then I finished my schooling here in Australia. One thing that my parents instilled in all of us is that gender was irrelevant and your success is a direct correlation to being willing to work hard and grab the opportunities as they present themselves. I wasn't especially academic in my uni and PY years, but what those missteps taught me was that you should always learn something from these events. And also, you dust yourself off and try again. The failures are not what defines you. I'm incredibly grateful to EY. Firstly, for taking a chance on a country campus student who had no experience in accounting and who admitted in their interview that auditing was probably their worst subject. EY has continued to give me amazing opportunities over the past 32 years, perhaps because I was the only one dumb enough to say yes to most of these roles. But more likely, it was because not only did I say yes when I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, I did it relatively unsupervised and with not much diary time taken up for the firm's leaders. One thing I know for sure though, is that once I am given an opportunity, I'm willing to work hard, learn from my mistakes, prove that being given the opportunity was warranted, and lastly, have some fun along the way. There are too many people to list tonight that helped me in my career. Many have been beacons of hope and examples of impressive leadership. Others who, without probably knowing it, provided examples of what not to do. But the three in particular I would like to call out are Tim Eddy, Alan Beckett and Ian Miller. 
Each of them were incredibly brave in decisions and opportunities they put me forward for over the first 20 years of my career. I remember an opportunity very early on in my career where I was asked to go to Cleveland on secondment. My natural reaction back then was to say no. What on earth would going on to a global project do for my career back here in Australia? Was this just a way for the Melbourne office to get rid of an extroverted auditor who wore loud clothes and who never shied away from calling out injustices she saw? In hindsight, they probably thought I belonged in a union. My big sister Heather gave me some very sage advice, which to this day still holds me in good stead and which I often reflect on when new, scary opportunities present themselves. Her comment to me was, what's the worst that can happen? She then helped me reframe the opportunity as exactly that, an opportunity to work on a global re-engineering project for a year. This project referred to as audit innovation, was what gave me the beginnings of my love for all things technical and auditing. It also gave me an incredible network of friends and colleagues, and it invigorated my passion for travel. Getting a chance to then join the IAASB was an incredible honour for a closet auditing geek. Although anyone who knows me would probably say I'm definitely not a closet geek. I'm a very proud auditor. The first IAASB chairman I worked with, Professor Arnold Schilder, definitely took a gamble on me after interviewing me. I'm pretty sure I didn't answer any of the standard questions he and Sir David Tweedy had for me that night. There were definitely a few raised eyebrows. Tom Seidenstein also supported me in continuing my role as the Deputy Chair for two years on the IAASB. To both of those chairs and all of the board members, staff, technical advisors and other stakeholders in the standard setting community, both here and globally, I will always reflect fondly on my time with the board. Plus, we now have a whole new group of global friends to travel with and visit. I am proud, honoured and humbled to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Thank you. Peter Douglas Easton graduated as valedictorian with a Bachelor of Agricultural Science and Bachelor of Economics from the University of Adelaide. He went on to complete a PhD in Business Administration at the University of California, Berkeley in 1983. He is presently the Notre Dame Alumni Professor of Accountancy and Academic Director of the Center for Accounting Research and Education at the Mendoza College of Business, University of Notre Dame. Prior to his appointment at Notre Dame in 2003, Peter was the John J. Gerlach Professor of Accounting at The Ohio State University the Pricewaterhouse Professor of Accounting and Finance at Macquarie University and Assistant Professor of Accounting at the University of Chicago. Peter Easton has served as visiting professor at a multitude of universities around the world, including Adelaide, Chicago, the Limburg Institute, Melbourne, NUS, Seoul National, the University of New South Wales, University of Technology, Sydney, and Victoria University of Wellington. He has contributed significantly through the supervision and examination of 21 PhD students and has made significant contributions to the accounting literature. His research deals with topics in corporate valuation, financial statement analysis, and more recently, sustainability. With Trevor Harris, he progressed the research from the seminal Ball and Brown 1968 paper to consider how the structure of accounting relates to ways in which accounting earnings are correlated with market prices. He introduced the earnings response coefficient methodology, which has become a mainstay of much empirical research and developed methods to extract from price an implied cost of capital using accounting information. The earning response coefficient methodology 
has been used in numerous courts of law to estimate damages arising from accounting misstatements and fraud. Peter Easton's research has been published widely in all the leading scholarly journals, and he is co-author of five important texts focused on financial statements. In 2022, he founded a peer-reviewed journal, Accountability in a Sustainable World Quarterly, which pa publishes papers written by both academics and practitioners, with a target audience of both groups. Peter Easton was a founding editor of the Review of Accounting Studies in 1994 and has served as associate editor of the Accounting Review, Accounting and Finance, Journal of Accounting Research, Contemporary Accounting Research, Journal of Business, Finance and Accounting, and the Journal of Accounting and Economics. Peter Easton has also been an institution builder. At the University of Notre Dame, he founded, with considerable success, the Centre for Accounting Research and Education, with the objective of strengthening the bridges between accounting research, accounting education, and accounting practice. In 2019, Peter Easton received the Limburg Medal from the Limburg Institute for his sustained contribution to the accounting research community in the Netherlands. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame honours Peter Douglas Easton as an eminent accounting scholar and thinker. I am deeply honoured to be elected to the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. I thank my nominators and the directors of the Centre for Accounting and Industry Partnerships for their belief in me. My gratitude for the honour is strongly reinforced by the fact that I have lived more than half my life in the United States, and this is a recognition from Australia, my home. The most important thing for me today is to take the opportunity to thank so many people who have made my life a wonderful, most enjoyable adventure. Most of all, I thank my family. My mother and father, who encouraged and supported my sister, my brothers and me, in undertaking higher education, even on my dad's bus driver income. And my precious daughters, who have been my constant supportive companions for over 40 years. They became my life partners at a very young age. They were and still are a constant source of encouragement, inspiration and much love. Thank you, Joanne and Stacey. It is really an honour to be included in the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. Many members of the Hall of Fame have helped me a great deal over the years. Please bear with me as I tell a brief story of the people who have had a major influence on the path of my professional life. First, Bob Lindner. Bob discouraged me from doing a master's degree at the University of Adelaide, and I think it was wise of him to advise me in the way he did. My plan, believe it or not, was to develop a method for estimating the cost of capital. Bob simply told me that it couldn't be done, but argued good reasons for his case. Of course, that was a catalyst for many years of my research. I'm not sure whether Bob was right or not, he might have been, but I've enjoyed years of pushing back against his advice, and I'm sure going to keep trying. And Jack Harrison. Jack was the head of School of Accountancy at the South Australian Institute of Technology, who counselled me to put my energy into accounting rather than valuation, which I was teaching at the Institute at the time. As a start, he encouraged me to call Ray Ball to talk about opportunities to pursue a PhD in accounting in the United States. That call to Ray who, as you know, is also a member of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame, changed my life. In preparation for the call, I found Ball and Brown, the famous 1968 paper in the Sayed Library. The motivation for the paper resonated with me, but I'm not sure I understood it at the time. So let me explain what I saw as the motivation 
Ray and Philip might disagree. But the motivation, as I saw it, was essentially there's a past literature, there had been a past literature, which essentially says that accounting is similar, or the arithmetic and accounting is similar to the arithmetic of subtracting eight shares from 27 tables. And the past literature said this is pretty meaningless. Well, Ray and Phillips set out, as you know, to find empirical evidence to support or refute this logic. Now, really, I thought, surely, remember, I'm a recent Aggie grad, removing only eight chairs, the only eight chairs around 27 tables is pretty meaningful, it seems to me. Now there's nowhere to sit. Both the chairs and the tables are useless. But I read on and I was delighted to learn that Ray and Philip showed that beyond doubt, subtracting chairs from tables is in fact meaningful. In short, accounting matters. I will return to this point. So I, a young, naive agricultural science grad, called Ray and asked for his advice. Ray welcomed my call. It was very encouraging and suggested that I should visit Berkeley. I should talk with the faculty and PhD students. And if accepted, I should go there. Ray continued to be a great mentor. He's a great mentor to this day. And he and his wife, Jan, have become wonderful friends. Then Berkeley. My wife, Chris, and I visited Berkeley. We were hosted by Julie and Peter Brownell. Peter, who is also a member of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame, was just graduating from Berkeley. Peter and I became great friends. As you might guess, we shared many bottles of great red wine. Berkeley was a wonderful place to do a PhD. In addition to a spectacular finance group and some extraordinary older accounting scholars, there were two brilliant young scholars who were just a little older than I was. Stephen Penman, who was another member of the Accounting Hall of Fame, and Jim Olson. Stephen and Jim became important mentors and very dear friends. How fortunate was I. Then I was fortunate to be appointed at the University of Chicago. Another heady place, which was quite different from Berkeley. The challenge of Chicago was huge and a lot of fun. Great people, great minds, incredible work ethic. There are too many people to list, but I must mention a few. Mark Smijewski, Sidney Davidson, Richard Lefwich, Bob Holthausen, Catherine Shipper, and Abby Smith. Also, it was at Chicago that I've developed my lifelong relationship with my colleague, mentor, co-author, and dear friend, Trevor Harris. Then back to Australia to Macquarie, working with Peter Brownell, many more bottles of red. During the next 30 years at the Ohio State University, the University of Chicago, and the University of Notre Dame, I had the privilege of working with great colleagues, not only at these universities, but at other universities around the world most notable being at the University of Melbourne and several Dutch and German schools. I thank my dear friend, Jan Bowens, for developing the Dutch Limburg courses for PhD students and encouraging me to teach in this Limburg program for the past 20 years. Finally, but by no means least important, much thanks must go to my co-authors and PhD students who have taught me so much over the years. They have made my life so enjoyable. I'm deeply indebted to them. Life has been fun, and I hope that while having fun, I've contributed a little to making our world a little better. We all affect the lives of the students who take our classes and read our books. But as I see it, this is not enough. 20 years ago, I set up the Center for Accounting Research and Education to, among other things, help to bridge the gap between academia and practice. I do hope this helped at least a little. I regret, however, that I did not do more to promote relevant academic research and to broaden the audience beyond the few readers 
of our academic journals. More recently, Laurie Marsh, who has been the mainstay of my professional life for the past 18 years, thank you so much, Laurie, and I set up a new journal, Accountability in a Sustainable World Quarterly. An aim of this journal is to encourage relevant research and communication between the academy and practice on the vital roles of measurement, quantification, assurance of measurement, and other aspects of accountability on the existential issue of sustainability. We invite you to join us on this new journey. As Ray succinctly states, accounting obviously matters. I'm extremely grateful to all who have made my professional and personal life so enjoyable. Thank you to all who have helped me in so many ways. I hope that those who are new to the accounting profession will find the opportunities, the friends, the colleagues, and the support that I was so fortunate to have. Thank you for honouring me as a member of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. Garrett Fitzgerald was a key figure in the advancement of the Australian accounting profession for almost 40 years from the late 1920s. He was heavily involved in improvements to public sector accounting, finance and administration. Like many men of his era, he enlisted in the first AIF and saw service on the Western Front in World War I. He was highly commended for an action on 30th of March 1918 when he led a patrol near the Somme, which inflicted heavy casualties on opposing German forces. Following demobilisation, he worked briefly for the tax department before joining his brother's firm, Fitzgerald Gunn, in the early 1920s, becoming a partner in 1930. Graduating with a BA in 1926 and BCom in 1927 from the University of Melbourne, Garrett tutored and lectured in financial accounting at the university for the next two decades. As well as playing a significant role in the development of accounting education at the University of Melbourne, he made an enduring contribution to the Australian and New Zealand accounting literature. He wrote 20 technical articles published in The Australian Accountant, and in 1946 he co-authored with A.E. Speck Accounts of Holding Companies in Australia, subsequently The Accounts of Holding Companies in Australia and New Zealand, a text that remained in print until the final edition in 1977. For more than two decades between 1942 and 1966, Garrett Fitzgerald was a senior office bearer at state and national levels as divisional councillor, general councillor, state president and national president of the then Australian Society of Accountants, now CPA Australia, and its antecedent bodies. In the early 1950s, he played an instrumental role in the negotiations which resulted in the 1953 merger of the Commonwealth and Federal Institutes of Accounting and the Australian Association of Accountants to produce Australia's largest accounting body. He was a fellow of the Australian Society of Accountants and the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Australia. Beyond his busy professional life, Garrett Fitzgerald also provided significant public service. In 1939, he re-enlisted in the Australian Army and during 1941-42 served as Assistant Director of Ordnance Services with the 4th Division. In civilian life, he was variously a member of the Tribunal on Salaries and Allowances of Federal MPs, the Committee of Inquiry into Salaries and Allowances of Victorian MPs, 
chair of the Committee of Inquiry into the Victorian Housing Commission, councillor and mayor of the city of Heidelberg, and commissioner for the Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works. Garrett Fitzgerald's contribution to accounting and the wider community was recognised in a number of ways. In 1955, he was awarded life membership of the Australian Society of Accountants. And in 1965, he was made a companion in the Order of St Michael and St George, CMG. In 1976, the University of Melbourne created the Fitzgerald Chair in Accounting to honour the contribution of Garrett and his brother, Sir Alec, to the Australian accounting profession. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame honours Garrett Ernest Fitzgerald as a war veteran, pioneer, practitioner, office holder and leader of the accounting profession. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege for me to attend the ceremony this evening as my father, Garrett Fitzgerald, is inducted into the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. I thank the Centre for Accounting and Industry Partnerships for the honour bestowed on my father. I would also like to thank Jeff Burrows for his strong belief in Garrett and all the work he put into preparing Garrett's nomination. I am very proud of what my father managed to achieve in the development of the accounting profession in Australia, and I am sure he would have been very honoured and appreciative of this recognition tonight. My father was born in Northcote in 1894, but had to leave school at the age of 14 to work as a clerk. He enlisted in the army at age 22, when the entry height was reduced low enough to allow him in. He went on to serve on the Western Front, was shot and wounded in action, but returned to the front as a lieutenant and was highly commended for action near the Somme, which inflicted heavy casualties on German forces. After returning from the war, Garrett resumed his education, obtained a company auditor's licence and passed all the exams allowing him to study for an arts degree at Melbourne University, along with his brother Alexander. At the conclusion of this degree, they enrolled in the newly created commerce degree. On completing this degree in 1927, my father became a part-time tutor and lecturer in the commerce faculty for some 20 years, where he played a significant role in the development of accounting education while working with his brother in the Melbourne office of Fitzgerald and Thompson. He played a key role in growing this business so that eventually it was a national 11-partner firm with almost 100 staff in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane and Adelaide. Within the practice, Garrett was a specialist in municipal auditing and auditor for the City of Melbourne from 1958 to 1960. Garrett made significant contributions to public service, the broader business community, and also the arts. On a municipal level, Garrett served as a commissioner of the Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works and was mayor of the city of Heidelberg from 1945 to 1946, having served as a councillor for many years. He was a member of the state and federal committees inquiring into salaries and allowances for members of parliament, and he chaired the 1956 Committee of Inquiry into the Victorian Housing Commission. During World War II, Garrett used his business skills and acumen to serve in army administration as a lieutenant colonel and contributed to the education program provided for ex-service personnel under the Commonwealth Reconstruction Training Scheme. 
In the 1940s, Garrett wrote numerous articles and also co-authored two books, one called The Accounts of Holding Companies in Australia and New Zealand, went through five editions over a 17-year period, becoming the standard reference work in this area of accounting. Garrett also worked hard for the advancement of the Australian accounting profession for over two decades from the early 1940s. He was a councillor and Victorian state and national president of the Commonwealth Institute of Accountants and a general councillor of the Australian Society of Accountants, as well as the Australian Institute of Cost Accountants. In 1955, he was made a life member of the Australian Society of Accountants. For more than two decades, he was a senior office bearer at both state and national levels and was an important facilitator of the integration of the AICA with the ASA, which was formalised in 1966. For someone who didn't start his accounting career until he was 30 years old, my father achieved a great deal in 42 years as he worked hard for the advancement of the Australian accounting profession. Melbourne University created the Fitzgerald Chair of Accounting in honour of Garrett and his brother, Sir Alexander. My father's induction into the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame tonight is a fitting tribute to a man who dedicated his life to service and the advancement of the accounting profession. Kim Michelle Langfield-Smith has made a significant and sustained contribution to the advancement of the accounting discipline through her work within the university sector and the wider accounting profession. She completed undergraduate economics at the University of Sydney, a Master of Economics at Macquarie University, and a PhD at Monash University. Kim commenced her academic career at the University of Technology, Sydney, followed by appointments at Tasmania, Melbourne, the Graduate School of Management, La Trobe and Monash. She was promoted to professor in 1998 and progressed through senior management roles as Head of Department, Associate Dean, Deputy Dean and Vice Provost Academic Performance prior to leaving Monash in early 2017. Kim Langfield-Smith's career in academia has influenced and shaped research in management accounting, management control systems, strategy, performance measurement, and interorganisational relationships. She has published extensively in leading academic journals, including Accounting, Organisations and Society, and has co-authored leading management accounting textbooks. As lead author of Management Accounting, Information for Creating and Managing Value, now in its ninth edition, this text has the highest market share in the tertiary management accounting market in Australia. Kim has been an active participant or chair of several committees of the Australian Research Council, particularly in relation to the Excellence in Research in Australia assessment exercise, including evaluation, impact submission, and research data management. In 2021, she returned to Monash to work in the student misconduct area and in December 22 was appointed the University Student Ombudsman. In 2022, she was also appointed as a technical fellow at the Australian Accounting Standards Board tasked with reviewing public sector accounting standards. In parallel with her university career, Kim is an active member of the Australian and international accounting professions. For more than 20 years, she was a member of, or chaired many CPA Australia committees, including chair of the Course Accreditation Committee and the Professional Qualifications Advisory Committee. She is currently a member of the Disciplinary Tribunal. For six years, she represented CPA Australia and Chartered Accountants Australia in New Zealand, or CANS, on the International Accounting Education Standards Board, or the IAESB. Kim chaired several international task forces that rewrote key education standards and represented the IAESB at several professional accounting conferences. 
Kim has also brought her accounting knowledge and skills to a wide range of roles as a board member or member of audit and risk committees of various not-for-profit and local government organisations. Kim Langfield-Smith is a fellow of CPA Australia and in 2014 her contribution to the accounting profession was recognised with a Lifetime Achievement Award from CPA Australia. The Accounting and Finance Association of Australia and New Zealand designated her as a Fellow in 2012 and awarded her Life Membership in 2016. In 2017, Monash University conferred the title Emeritus Professor in recognition of her significant contributions to the university. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame honours Kim Michelle Langfield-Smith as a researcher, educator and university administrator of the highest order. I am very honoured to be inducted into the 2023 Accounting Hall of Fame. Thanks go to David Smith, who nominated me for this award, and to Robin Moroni, who assisted him. I would also like to thank the Nominations Review Panel for considering my nomination and for recommending my induction. I have had so many positive and satisfying experiences over my academic career, and much of that can be attributed to the people that I've worked with, who encouraged and supported me. I'm so grateful to the wonderful accounting colleagues who I've worked with over the years. One of my earliest university appointments was at the University of Tasmania in the mid-1980s. I'd like to thank Stuart Leach, a former Hall of Fame inductee, for being the first colleague to encourage me to undertake research and to seriously think about pursuing an academic accounting career. I was pretty laid back at the time and had no aspirations to study for a PhD or to build a career. Rob Chennault, another former Hall of Fame inductee, was a particularly important influence on my career, first as my master's supervisor and then as an academic colleague and co-researcher. He encouraged me to be innovative and to aim very high. David Smith, my former PhD student, co-researcher and co-teacher, has been another wonderful creative colleague. As I took on more management roles, Karen Chalmers was a strength and a great support, particularly when I was head of department. As I moved up the ranks at Monash University, I was privileged to work with some great academic leaders, many of whom may not be well known to you. Professor Edwina Cornish, a former provost at Monash University, is a biochemist. She was my boss and close colleague for several years. She encouraged me to be brave, be adventurous and to take risks. She is still watching and supporting me. My work with CPA Australia over many years has also given me so much satisfaction and has provided me with an ongoing and important link to the accounting profession. My involvement helped me to develop new skills and created opportunities to contribute to the broader accounting profession. Finally, a big thanks to my husband Ian, who has been a strength and support right from my Tasmania days. Stephen Leslie Taylor. Stephen Taylor graduated with BCom Honours from UNSW and Master of Economics Honours from Macquarie University before returning to UNSW to complete his PhD at the Australian Graduate School of Management. He was appointed to a Chair of Accounting at the University of Sydney in 1995, where he served as Academic Director of the Accounting Foundation. Stephen then moved to UNSW as Professor of Accounting where he also served as Acting Associate Dean Research. He is currently Distinguished Professor of Accounting in the Business School at the University of Technology, Sydney, having previously served as Head of the School of Accounting and Associate Dean Research. Stephen has also had visiting professorships at the Ross Business School at the University of Michigan and Victoria University, Wellington. From 2002 to 2008, Stephen helped to establish the research program of the Capital Markets Cooperative Research Centre, leading a program directed towards the identification and measurement of accounting manipulation and ultimately 
fraudulent financial reporting. Stephen has also been closely involved in the establishment of the Securities Industry Research Centre of Asia Pacific, the Financial Integrity Research Network, and the Centre for International Finance and Regulation. In May 2017, Stephen Taylor was appointed as a member of the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Stephen's teaching and research covers financial reporting and valuation. He has wide experience teaching at undergraduate and postgraduate levels, especially in the areas of accounting-based valuation models, investment analysis and financial reporting. He has supervised 20 PhDs to completion. Stephen Taylor's research has focused on the economics of auditing, capital markets and information, and the links between governance mechanisms and the quality of accounting information. He has built a comprehensive body of Australian-centred work focused on the attributes of Australian accounting and assurance, and has significantly advanced our knowledge of the efficient functioning of Australian capital markets and the accounting and auditing practices of Australian firms. His research has been published in many top-tier international journals. He's co-authored 1995 Journal of Accounting and Economics paper with Alan Craswell and Jerry Francis, is one of the most highly cited auditing research papers and the founding work in the auditor specialisation field. Stephen is currently a senior editor of the International Journal of Accounting and editor International Journal of Accounting Research. He has served as Associate Editor of Accounting Horizons and as a member of editorial boards of several leading journals. Stephen has received many large Australian Research Council grants and has served the Council as an expert assessor and peer reviewer. He has also served on the Research Quality Framework Assessment Panel and the Research Evaluation Committee for the Excellence of Research in Australia Assessment Exercise in the economics and business field. Stephen is a Fellow of Chartered Accountants Australia in New Zealand and in 2020 delivered the CPA Annual Research Lecture at the University of Melbourne. In 2017, Stephen Taylor was elected as a Fellow of the prestigious Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. The Australian Accounting Hall of Fame honours Stephen Leslie Taylor as a scholar, thinker, educator and university administrator of the highest order. Thank you to the directors, the nomination review panel and the sponsors of the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. It's truly a great honour to have received this recognition. Thank you too to my nominators, Professor Sue Wright, Head of Accounting at UTS, and Dr Keith Kendall, Chair of the Australian Accounting Standards Board, as well as my very good colleague at UTS, Professor Yarwin Shan. It is truly a great honour to be included as part of a distinguished, such a distinguished group of practitioners and academics. It is, of course, very nice as an individual to receive recognition for what we do. But I think we all know that most individual achievement in whatever profession we pursue reflects the benefits that we get from those who we're privileged to share our professional and personal development with. When I look back at the course that my career has taken, I think about when I began my commerce and law degrees at the University of New South Wales. And I have to say that when I first walked in the gate there as an undergraduate student, the last thing I ever imagined is that one day I'd walk back through the gate as a professor of accounting. But during the course of my studies, and particularly when I commenced an honours year, I came in contact with four young scholars who truly uh, helped me see uh, a real enthusiasm for accounting research and the breadth of possibilities that encompassed. And I'm thinking there of Mark Hurst, Ian Zimmer, Ken Trotman, and especially Greg Whitred, who supervised my honours thesis and subsequently became a colleague, a co-author, and a really great mentor as well. But at that point, I wasn't so convinced about academia as a career. So I went and got a job as a tutor at Macquarie University. I did a master's degree in statistics and finance that proved to be a big benefit to my doctoral studies subsequently. And I also made some great academic friends there, including Carrick Martin, Dick Tress, Ian Young, Graham Harrison, Jill McKinnon, 
Rob Coombs and Peter Eddy, who I should add showed me how to properly teach consolidations. So at this point, I was pretty convinced that uh, I wouldn't pursue a career as an auditor. I would, in fact, pursue a career as an academic. That led to me doing my PhD at the Australian Graduate School of Management. And that program, as it was then structured, really gave me a great appreciation that I hold to this day of just how important it is that researchers receive good quality research training. What we do is really a function of our ability to do it. And I think that's where that PhD program is something I'm really grateful for. I was able to take classes taught by people like George Foster, Ross Watts, both of whom are members of the Hall of Fame, and Peter Dodd, who also supervised my dissertation, and especially Ray Ball's class on accounting and the theory of the firm. Along with the classes I took on financial economics and econometrics, that framework has served me very, very well in terms of my subsequent research, and I'm really grateful for that. I also had great doctoral colleagues in that program, Don Stokes and Mike Aitken, both of whom have subsequently been colleagues, uh, co-researchers and friends to this day. During my academic career, I've also had the benefit of some wonderful colleagues and mentors. I mentioned Greg Whitred previously, but also at the University of Sydney, I specifically want to mention Alan Craswell and Terry Walter both of whom I have written papers with. In fact, Terry uh, probably is close to the, the author with whom I have written the most papers. At UNSW, I was part of a group of four professors, the others of whom are all members of the Hall of Fame. Ken Trotman, Roger Simnett and Wai Fog Chua, all wonderful colleagues. I also had had the opportunity during my career to work with some truly wonderful senior academics and there are two that I particularly want to highlight uh, in this acceptance speech. One is Philip Brown, another member of the Hall of Fame who needs no introduction. And the other is Jerry Francis, with whom I continue to work today. I was also very fortunate to be able to spend two extended periods as a faculty member at the University of Michigan and to have the opportunity to interact with some truly outstanding scholars there, such as Doug Skinner, Paddy de Chow and Richard Sloan, among many others. I'm obviously very grateful to the then head of the accounting group, uh, Jean Imhoff, for facilitating both of those visiting opportunities. Well, for the last 15 years, I've been at UTS and the time really has flown. I've been very fortunate here at UTS to be just a very small part of a great group of people, both business school wide especially reflecting on my time as the Associate Dean Research, but especially as part of the accounting group here at UTS. What an amazing group of colleagues these are. Their enthusiasm, their natural interest in inquiry is something that serves as a massive form of encouragement. So the lesson I've taken away from thinking back about my career well, individual achievement is, uh, is great when it's recognised, and that's something we all appreciate, but it truly is something that is built on the input of many, many others. And in reflecting on that, last but certainly not least, the most important group I want to acknowledge is my family. I'm truly grateful to have two wonderful children, Joshua and Chelsea, and most of all, I'm very fortunate to have had the support of a wonderful wife, Jennifer. For more than 30 years, she's put up with me, encouraged me, and helped me to grow to understand what truly matters. And I truly owe her a special thanks for that. Again, thank you to the Hall of Fame, and thank you to everyone who has been part of my professional journey. <laughs>